Welcome to the Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor. Now, here's your host, Tom Lindquist. Glad to have you back in the Leadership Lyceum, where we bring you direct access to top CEOs and directors of boards in an interview format that provides insight on situational issues that confront CEOs every day. It is a CEO's virtual mentor. Welcome to episode six. I'm delighted to feature Andy Mooney, CEO of Fender Musical Instruments Corporation, in part one of this two-part interview. Many of our listeners are familiar with Fender Instruments, and some may be familiar with Fender's history. There have been many books and articles written about this legendary brand of guitars, basses, and amplifiers, so I'll just provide enough history to set context. We'll look at the brand from a unique angle. As you've come to expect from the podcast, we'll look through the lens of the leader through a conversation with the leader. The company was founded by Leo Fender in 1946 in Fullerton, California. By 1951, Fender offered its first mass-produced, solid-body, Spanish-style electric guitar. It was first called the Broadcaster, and shortly thereafter became the Telecaster. In 1954, Fender mass-produced the immensely popular Stratocaster. Fender's legendary status presents us with a little bit of a chicken and egg dilemma. It's hard to tell in hindsight if Fender guitars were part of the regalia and the coronation of the guitar hero, or if instead the guitar gods applied their talent to establish Fender as an iconic brand. In any event, it's safe to assume a codependency between brand and god. Think Fender and Stevie Ray Vaughan, The Edge, Ingve Malmsteen, David Gilmore, Jimi Hendrix, and Eric Clapton's famous Blackie. In 1965, Fender transferred ownership of the company to CBS Corporation. CBS had purchased the company from Leo Fender for $13 million. That's $2 million more than CBS paid for the New York Yankees the year before in 1964. CBS sold the company 20 years later in 1985 to a group of employees led by CBS executive William Schultz. There has been private equity ownership over the years since CBS, leading up to December 2012 and its current ownership, which includes Servco Pacific and TPG. Although Fender's private, 2011 revenues were about $700 million. We'll be right back to get our interview underway. Andy Mooney joined Fender as CEO a little over a year ago in June of 2015. Andy is not only a product and brand expert and authority with cutting-edge experiences from Nike and Disney that he's bringing to Fender, but he also hails from Scotland and carries on that country's time-honored tradition of engaging conversation and the gift of the story. I'm honored to play the James Boswell to his Samuel Johnson in the conversation that follows. I joined Andy in his new Hollywood offices, which were still in the finishing touches of the build-out on September 14th, 2016. You might hear some faint background drilling during our discussion. Fender had their grand opening celebration of the new Hollywood offices one week after our meeting on September 22nd. Please link to this LA Weekly article on the back of the album cover for some great photos of Fender's new and inviting Hollywood space, including shots of Andy and his executive team. Let's join our conversation. I thought we could start with your mandate coming in. What was TPG and Servco seeking from your leadership of the company? Two slightly different things, which is why it took the board uh, quite a bit of time to conduct a search. Servco have been an investor in the company since its buyback from CBS. They are probably characterize them as the ideal investor. <laughs> very long-term oriented, very respectful of the brand and its history. So they were really looking for a CEO who could um, not just mine the core business, but actually nurture and grow the core business. They bought out Western Presidio when Western Presidio's fund had just run its course. So they were the principal investor, but they purposefully brought in TPG because they felt that they needed a partner that could bring resources to the company that they didn't really have access to. 
TPG's primary interest is in leveraging the brand equity into the digital products and services space, which you know they see as a high growth, high margin uh, category. So they were looking for a CEO who was very future oriented and very interested in developing digital products and services. It's helpful here to insert a little background on Andy for context. Andy hails from Scotland and holds an accounting certificate in the United Kingdom. He originally joined Nike's UK division in finance roles before transitioning to marketing in 1982. He relocated to the United States with Nike in 1984, becoming Nike's chief marketing officer 10 years later in 1994. Over his 20 years with Nike, he served as general manager of Nike's $3 billion global apparel business and founded its equipment division. As chief marketing officer, he was responsible for marketing strategies for the Nike and Jordan brands. From Nike, he joined Disney and spent 11 years leading Disney consumer products, first as president, then as chairman. He pioneered the $4 billion Disney Princess franchise and also developed product lines based on the Pixar animation films Toy Story and Cars. He joined surfing brand Quicksilver as CEO in 2013 and was attracted as CEO of Fender in June 2015. Let's join back into the interview where I interrupted Andy. The planets completely aligned when when I left Quicksilver because Fender and I had talked about joining the company and or joining the board for many years, but the company was always based in Scottsdale. I have a nine-year-old daughter I wanted very much to be located in Los Angeles, so it, it just wasn't working for either of us. But in the conversation that we had post Quicksilver, <laughs> when they mentioned that they'd taken a lease on this building, which is 15 minutes from my house, everything just started to fall into place. So for me, it was really important to make sure that, uh, I, that this is counsel I would give to anyone, is to make sure that your, ex- your expectations of what can be done in the role and the board's expectations are completely aligned. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so far I've been in the position slightly over a year. We continue to be completely aligned. Uh, everything is completely on track. In fact, better than better than we hoped for. Um, but I, I think, see, I brought something to the table that, strangely enough, not any previous CEO going all the way back to the founder. I'm the first guitar player that the company has ever had. I mean, I had this collection before I joined the company, um, so I'm a deep, deep fan of the brand and its product, Mm -hmm. but very interested in um, developing the brand, you know, for the next generation of guitarists. You have experience with iconic brands and founders, with Phil Knight at Nike, here with, if you go all the way back to Leo Fender here, Disney, you did major transformation at Disney, and uh, with the Disney Princess, discovered something, I think it was at Disney on Ice, that, uh, that launched that very large business. How do you look at the brand here at Fender? Well, I I was fortunate enough to spend a little bit of time with Steve Jobs when he was both in the position of CEO of Pixar, but also ultimately the larger shareholder at Disney before his death. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he and I violently agreed on is that great brands are the cumulative effect of great products. (laughs) Um, You know, marketing and retail stores and all of that, um, all of the great things that, that Apple have done and Nike have done they come on the top of great product. You can't market bad product. You can't, you know, retail bad product. So I look at Nike, I look at Disney, I look at uh, Fender, and the, the similarity is this just deep-rooted passion and obsession about the quality of the product that, you know, went all the way back nearly 70 years in Leo's case. And you know, so in each case, it, it kind of does go back to the founder. <laughs> and the founder really establishing the principle of in the case of Nike and in the, in the case of Fender, form following function, which is always, I think, the recipe for enduring design. Um, and in the case of Disney, really, John Lasseter from Pixar used to say this all the time, that quality is a business model, that really, really focusing on the quality of the product makes a big difference in building brand equity over time. We'll dig deeper into brand here. I mentioned NAM in what follows. That's the National Association of Music Merchants. With this brand, with Fender, um, well, I'll tell you, I, I saw your interview. You were interviewed at NAM, 
And then uh, Nam puts out these interesting oral histories. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's quite quite impressive. And although they didn't do an oral history interview with Leo, they did one with Phyllis, his wife. She talked about, and this may get a little deep philosophical, religious, but she talked about Leo really feeling like um, he was serving angels and that musicians were angels. He was put on this earth to provide them their instruments to do their own calling. It's a pretty deep feeling about something that a brand has arisen Mm -hmm. from. How do you interpret that? And I'm sorry to get deep. <laughs> no, I think it's, um, you know, we had an informal opening of the LA office just a few days ago, and I talked about, you know, been, again, I've been fortunate. You work at Nike, your business is creating shoes, but it's the things that athletes do with those shoes that, mm-hmm. you know, really builds, builds the equity in the brand. In Disney, it's really the emotion that the content creates in movie theaters or at the theme parks. It's those magic moments that get created between father and mother and child, son, daughter, families, whatever it might be. In our case, it's very similar. I mean, we owe everything to what the artists do with their product. Much of the equity has been built by the memorable music that's been created for, let's say, nearly seven decades. And every genre, every continent, every style, and we're very fortunate if you look at the stage of most major festivals this year, Lollapalooza, Coachella, about 90% of the artists are on the stage are using our product. So that notion that Leo had, which I'm sure Phyllis accurately described it, we still have it. We serve, we have it written down, you know, we serve, we serve artists, that's what we do. And we obsess about the product, those two things in combination are really important. And as I say, I think what Nike does and what Fender does is very analogous in the sense that working with artists who are absolutely at the top of their craft and developing signature products for them takes you down paths that you wouldn't normally have thought about. So working with the best artists is in many ways completely tied to the product development, the R&D process, the the exploratory process. Absolutely was the case with Nike, and it's absolutely the case here at Fender. Was that the case when you came in a little over a year ago? Did you have that relationship with the artists? Has that always been the case, or did you have to rebuild that? No, no, that's been an essential component of the company for nearly seven decades. It's something that, in fact, I want to invest in even more in the sense that there are many people in the music community who are influential. As I was a young student of guitar, I looked to the stage and Richie Blackmore was my hero, so I ended up gravitating towards the Strat, literally in the color that he played it in. I'm sure many kids who emulated, who you know, aspired to be Michael Jordan did in the case with, with Nike. But there are other people who are very influential, like instructors. Mm -hmm. Um, And we really believe that instruction is one of the things that we really want to invest in, which is really the primary raison d'etre for the office here is, you know, we're in the process of recruiting 100 people to create digital products and services to help the next generation of guitars make it through. Most students of guitar abandon the instrument in the first three months to a year. The ones who don't commit to the instrument for life and essentially become the industry and they end up in some cases being obsessive like me and having big collections. If we could reduce the abandonment rate by just 10%, we have the potential to double the size of the industry. Um, But more importantly, I think we've got a chance to have a universe of guitar players who could create the next generation's memorable music. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back. We're back with Andy Mooney, CEO of Fender. What is the psychology behind this abandonment? Because I think you'd mentioned 90% abandonment, and that's something probably unique to... This industry versus Nike, it probably wasn't an issue with Disney other than kids growing older. You mentioned Richie Blackmore, and I can imagine what age you were when you were listening to Rainbow. 
you're very impressionable at that age. Are you addressing an age to try to solve the abandonment issue to, to an extent? Yeah, I was, I was very fortunate. You know, um, Bono and Edge are on our board, and uh, Edge and I were having a conversation over lunch about what route we both took to learning guitar. And strangely enough, we both grew up on nylon-strung acoustic guitars, you know, basically classical Spanish guitar. I, for a very brief moment in time, when I was quite young, taught young, very young students. I didn't know that much, so the students I taught knew even less. They were really people who were picking up the instrument for the first time. But I would get eight, nine-year-old girls who would show up with 12... 12-string, steel-strung acoustic guitars that even I couldn't play, physically couldn't play. Somebody once said that the guitar has the most uh, challenging user interface that you could imagine, steel strings on your on young hands. So going back to Leo, Leo in the 60s, one of them is up on the wall out here, is he created student guitars, uh, short-scale necks, uh, thinner necks did two things. It made it easier for the student to get physically get their hand around them. The shorter scale uh, made, meant they could move up and down the fretboard quicker, but also made bending the strings easy, less tension on the on the strings. So some of the things we want to do, we want to revisit the form to make it easier for people who are picking up the guitar for the first time to move into it. Some cases we're going to encourage parents depending on the age of the kid, maybe you should be buying them a ukulele uh, to begin, to really encourage you know, just dealing with fretting and not not going through the pain. We're thinking about innovation in strings. Mm -hmm. uh, can you have strings that have a different tactile feel with the same type of sonic resonance? And then we're also looking at, of course, the digital products and services side. What are the motivations that students need to get them through that first year? What's the coaching tips? Because a lot of them are just simply not taking lessons at all. Our intent is to bundle a free um, suite of lessons with every guitar that is in a price point range or a construction range that's likely to be in the hands of a first time player. On the one hand, we think that'll be an encouragement just to, for them to stick with the instrument, and if that's all it is, that's fine, but we also would see it as a entry point into having a lifelong relationship with them and offering them digital lesson development that would help them for many years. My young son is 11, and they've gotten their musical instrument for school that they have to play in their music class. It's a cello. Although I pushed him into piano five years ago and it didn't stick as much as we tried, now he seems to be at a point that he's really open to it and really excited about, and he's engaged with all his friends now playing it. I know that at this moment when he's excited about playing that having a, a guitar and something that he could manage would be very interesting and he's open to it right now. Yeah, I think one group that needs a lot of help on this is actually parents. My father played piano. He encouraged me to pick up an instrument, as many parents do, just mm -hmm. as a developmental. At least that's why I think he encouraged me. So I gravitated towards the guitar. He paid for my lessons when I was in, in grade school. So I think a lot of parents go through that process of, I'd like my child to learn an instrument. Piano is too expensive, it's too big of a commitment, even though it's a great instrument to learn on. Guitar is more accessible. But then they don't really know, should I buy them an electric, should I buy them acoustic, what should the scale be, should I have four strings, should I have six strings. So one of the things we want to do in our own Fender.com communication with the audience of people who would want to buy guitars, parents in particular, is kind of help them through a you know, decision path. Is your child seven or eight? What are their musical interests? What are, what are the tastes? And then when they buy the guitar, even then one of the quick wins to help people really embrace the instrument is finding a simple song that they can play back to their parents or their friends. It always helps if it's in the genre that they personally like. So as part of the both product registration and the access to get your free lesson bundle, if you declare, okay, I'm, I like country and western music or I like rock music, then that will influence the suite of song lessons that we give you to learn. You know, we might pick songs that are in that genre that have three chords, simple chords. If you can get the, if you can get the child or, or whatever age, the new player to that 
first moment where they naturally can go through a song from start to finish, you know, that's a major, a major milestone for a student. That alone could be the trigger that would take them to the next level. Yeah, you set them up on kind of a progression where they're accomplishing and they see the fruits of their yeah. labor and, and that, that in turn inspires more development. Yeah. Another concept, I wonder what you think about communities and what I mean by that. We went to a a nascent funk museum in Dayton, Ohio, and what I was impressed by is at the time in the early 70s, funk kind of came out of the Ohio area, and all these guys knew one another and they played together, and you had a community that was built, and great things, a whole genre came out of that community. And I wonder how you think about communities and the sustainability of that for the instrument. There's there's a progression that usually you know, people who play any instrument go, would go through, but I think particularly guitar. And we believe there's something like 50 million active guitarists in the world at any point in time. Mm-hmm. But they, I mean, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, there are solo performers who just want to do campfire work or just, just want to master the instrument and sing for their own benefit. And then there's people who want to play in bands. Actually, the people who want to play in bands are definitely the minority. The great majority is people who just want to master the instrument so that they can uh, play the guitar in a solo form, but in a group environment. We absolutely believe that community is important, um, but a a lot of the value of the community in our digital products and services realm will be getting tips from each other. How did you overcome what everybody calls the the F chord hurdle, which Mm. is the first chord where you actually have to play a a bar A chord on the guitar. It's almost almost like a rite of passage. Mm. Um, There are ways to actually get around it. So when you you see in these these forums from people who are learning off each other is that they're they're looking for tips. And that, that part of the community we think will be very helpful in getting people to kind of again hang with the instrument longer than they they historically have let's take a quick break we'll be right back we're back with andy mooney ceo of fender Andy, how do you create this Richie Blackmore factor that you experienced in order to draw people in? I had my uh, heroes in music, too, that inspired. It was the celebrity, the status of these guys that drew me and drew my interest. How are you recreating that draw? Well, the, I wouldn't say that the days of the guitar god have, have gone, but the guitar, there's less guitar virtuosos, I think, in contemporary music than there were when I was growing up, mm-hmm. and that's totally okay. The guitar is a, it's a fascinating instrument because it's both a melodic instrument, but it's also a percussive instrument. So, you know, if you go all the way back to guys like Bo Diddley, he used it very much as a percussive instrument and used it in very, very simple song construction. So I think today the guitar is predominantly used as a compositional and a performance instrument. And the, the young players who want to adopt the instrument are st- still looking to the stage to emulate what their heroes are doing. They're performing different forms of music from when I grew up and know music will evolve yet again um, you know, five, ten years from now. And, you know, one of, the, one of the misconceptions, I think, is that, you know, the demise of the electric guitar has been, has been greatly, greatly exaggerated. Mm-hmm. For example, one of the most searched songs on YouTube to learn how to play it is from Drake. Uh-oh. Um, you know, so you're getting many of the very popular rap songs, people are looking to find ways how to play them on guitar Mm -hmm. or play them on piano because they just want to be able to replicate that song and they need to know the chord construction to do it. The forms of music will perpetually change, but the guitar is both the foundational instrument for composition and live performance, but also for what I call campfire Variations of any genre of song from Adele to, to Drake, I, I think that's always, always going to be there. The other big thing that's really changing about the industry, which I'm hugely encouraged by, is 
if you asked most people in the industry what the demographic makeup would be by gender, they would say probably 70%, 80% male, you know, 20, 30% female. That's actually totally untrue. We've actually embarked upon a pretty comprehensive consumer research study not long after I joined. And the market is surprisingly split about 50-50 now. Mm. That is encouraging. Uh, and I think, again, it's attributable to a lot of the very successful women who are performing these days. You know, many of them use it. Taylor Swift, I think, is a you know, classic case in point. Um, many of them who are using guitar in both composition and in live performance. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that's great. The industry, I think, hasn't quite, I'd say the retail side of the industry and even the wholesale side of the industry hasn't quite caught up with that trend yet. I don't think, A, they've fully acknowledged it, and B, they've adjusted to it. And by adjusting to it, in our case, I don't mean creating pink guitars, but you've got to really think about, because of the difference in the frame of women vis-a-vis men, the difference in hand size vis-a-vis men, you've got to be thinking about neck shapes, you've got to be thinking about weight of the body. So, and a lot of the most popular indie artists are actually gravitating towards these mid-60s student guitars. Interesting. Um, Leo never, th- I'm sure, never thought about that at the time. But right. That's been a kind of guiding light for us to thinking about, we are not going to make a woman's guitar, but we are going to make guitars that women will like. That's interesting, because I know he was redesigning guitars based on the feel and the artist feedback that he would get and designing the body so they'd be more comfortable. But I'm sure he wasn't designing for a different body type that uh, a woman might have versus a man. Yeah, I I think in Japan, for example, right now, the shift is even more profound because uh, about 70% of new players in Japan are women. And that's as much a function of the rise of the the girl bands that are over there. Baby Metal is a you know, huge band over there. Hmm. Scandal is a band that we, you know we have a deep relationship with. Your four girl four girl brand, all all playing Fender. Um, and a lot of the young girls are emulating that now. Again, if you're in Tokyo, nobody, particularly young people, they're not driving a car. So they're carrying their instrument on the subway train oh, from point A to point B. Brands like Louis Vuitton, for example, found that when they reduced the weight of the handbags, that uh, sales escalated hmm. because it was just more convenient for women to carry them on subway train. So, you know, we're thinking about the construction of the cases, how <laughs> the weight away to the guitar... You have to take the entire environment in which the artist is playing and learning into consideration when you're actually designing the form. That's very interesting. You wouldn't uh, wouldn't think about that. You'd be thinking about performance only, but performance goes from the house to <laughs> to the studio to. Yeah, I mean, another classic case in point is that uh, we introduced acoustic amps last year. A because more women gravitate towards acoustic than electric. And many of them want to have their amps in the living room rather than in the bedroom or in the basement. We designed the amps to both sonically perform but to look like a piece of furniture Mm. as opposed to looking like a black box Mm -hmm. that you would have on stage, Mm -hmm. which, you know, the prototypical electric amp. Uh, That totally resonated. Um, So you've got to, again, you've got to think about who's the likely consumer for this, where is the the product likely to be located, Um, What's the primary motivation for what they want to do with it? And that just further emphasizes the proximity that you need to these artists to to understand the challenges that they face and the design requirements. Yeah, that's that's what I love about the LA office is that very few brands generate sufficient emotion for anybody to write a book about their history. Um, And as you know, Mm -hmm. Fender's had multiple books written about its origins, its products, the people who created them. So I'm sure there will be future books written about Fender's history, and many of them will probably mark 2016 as Fender's return to California. That's not actually accurate, because we never left. I see. (laughs) We've been making guitars in California for 70 years. We'll be making them for at least another 70 years. But what I like about 
the 50 people that we have here that are in product line management and marketing, the fact that they can jump in a car, head down four or five and be in the Corona factory, it just means that we will be able to serve artists at a higher level than we ever have. And this particular location where you've got MTV over there, you've got every significant recording studio within walking distance. Um, you know, we've only been here since July. This is September. We've had you know any any of the big bands that are in tour. We had Jim Root from Slipknot in here last week. It's just easy for them to drop by. And the more that we can communicate with artists, the more that we can be involved in a very vibrant LA music scene here, the better company will be. I see that clearly. You set yourself up as almost an open house, and uh, the welcome that's out for people to drop in and maybe down there in the uh, cafe area you'll have some of the greatest artists just uh, hanging around and uh, dropping in, I, I would imagine. You, well, yeah, we will. We absolutely will. That ends part one of a two-part interview with Andy Mooney, CEO of Fender. Keep a lookout for part two, where we'll continue to focus on Andy's product and brand leadership and his application of lessons learned at Nike and Disney to brand, product, and supply chain at Fender. We mentioned a great deal of names in this episode and refer to visuals. If you're listening through the podcast app in iTunes, please be sure to check out the back of the album cover for links to NAM, various videos, and articles on Fender. Keep an eye out for part two, and we'll see you next time. The Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor, has been a production of The Leadership Lyceum, LLC. Copyright 2016. All rights reserved. Come back and listen. It's lonely at the top.